Thanks for having us. I think Lucas's instructions to us, uh, I'll just share them so you can contextualize our comments. They, uh, we were asked to present to you radical ideas that will make you think we're completely insane. But I will put my name next to the five ideas that I'll present and our collective mission is to show you some ideas we think will be real in the next five years that involve the brain. And I think all of them involve just the most current science and some stuff that still has to be invented in the next four or five years. I have the least scientific background of the panel, so I'll just give you my crazy ideas first and we can hear the better ones in a moment. I have a PhD in cognitive science and I'm a gadget person. I made many gadgets and mobile companies over the last few years. And I'll tell you about one of my new companies right now. The two big themes that I think are powerful that my ideas connect to, one, is the power of brain input and output, brain I.O. In the last 10 years since I left graduate school, we can read the brain, we can write to the brain and create images inside the brain, and we can have direct action on the brain to change how it actually functions. The second big vector, which is the one that has driven my career in mobile phones for Virgin Mobile and the smartphone peak, has been miniaturization and improved um, uh, resolution of devices, devices that are smaller, that work with batteries and that can operate at a distance with radio waves and transmission of energy. So here's my five inventions, and I promise you these over the next five years. One of them I'm working on, it's the first one. We announced it today. It's called Halo Neuroscience, and we announced the funding with Andreessen Horowitz and Softech VC. A wearable device you put on your head that makes your brain work better. A device to make you smarter is the idea. The second one is software. It uses the front door, the command line of the brain, which are the senses that you already use to gather information and put them back out. On a smartphone screen, images, text, and sound to influence your eyes, ears, and other experiences to change sleep. Monitor how you sleep and then make you sleep using hypnosis, meditation, cognitive behavioral therapy, and some of the other techniques that in the past were things that were merely artisanal. Uh, things that only magical people might come and show you, but now can be algorithmically defined and distributed through software. And now I only give you the third one, because I think time is limited and you'll have to find me at the beer garden. The other two, you'll really want to hear them, but I just tell you the third one. <laughs> an embeddable object that fits in your skin, like an RFID tag that finds dogs, very low power, that transmits energy, it fits in your skin, maybe behind your ear, and transmits energy into your auditory processing system. A thing to help you hear by directly stimulating that part of your brain. I think you'll have this device in five years. So these are my three. Okay. Um, I'm really out of, out of my comfort zone. I'm a neuroscientist, uh, academic. Um, I don't have a business. At uh, the same time, I spent the last uh, six months in a business school. So I was asked by Kellogg, the School of Business in Chicago, to come and teach uh, neuroscience to MBAs. And the idea would be to bridge somehow between what neuroscientists know to what businessmen care about. How people make decisions, how you can enhance their thoughts, and what you can do to make better predictions about people's choices. So I'm going to try to tell you about the list of ideas that I'm trying to tell my students could be here in the next five years. Now, I felt really uncomfortable when I was asked to speak about the future. There's a quote by von Neumann that I really like that says, uh, predictions are very hard, especially about the future. And I'm uh, a little bit uncomfortable, so I try to be really tamed in thinking of the, the kind of five things that I think are going to be here uh, soon. So here they are. First, I think that uh, we're going to see less criminals in prison, and a lot of them are going to be medicated. So you can hear a lot of stories in the last couple of months of people who uh, uh, committed mass murders, going to schools and shooting students. And uh, time and again, when you look at those people, we learn that there was some kind of mental disorder attached to this thing. And more and more, we learn that people that do bad things aren't necessarily bad people per se. They actually have some kind of mental disorder that we could maybe cure. And the more we help those people, we can actually uh, send them to different approaches. Instead of sending them to prison and claiming that they're just bad, we're going to start figuring out that there's maybe a way to actually help them and prevent crime by figuring out what underlies this thing. This is one thing. Another thing I think we're going to see a lot of, a lot of uh, is an uh, introduction of uh, neuroscience to the courthouses. I was speaking to a judge recently 
who said that uh, neuroscientists come to judges time and again and say, now we have a tool to actually help you understand what people want, and they time and again uh, say that we're not good enough. But uh, in the last three years, they actually started to listen to uh, scientists and invite them to courthouses. I think we're going to see more of that. More of that, not in the sense that we're going to see lie detectors, but we will see a lot more people that actually can uh, figure out if you're familiar with something. So instead of telling you, were you there and did how you did it, you can actually see if you're familiar with one of the five items that were used for the crime. And this would be an indication that you've been there or that you know something about it. So more neuroscientists in courthouses. Another place where neuroscientists are going to be a lot of uh, in, in businesses. So there already is a field called neuromarketing that is kind of growing where people are trying to replace focus groups and asking people questions about packages and about the uh, taste of the products by just looking at their brain. This is called neuromarketing. But now we're trying to see uh, experts of neuroscientists like me going to help board of directors in just making the right choices. We know now that people make decisions based on emotions as much as they make them based on logic. And as we pass the way it's done, we can actually figure out what decision-making process good, is good for you. Some people make decisions better in the morning, some in the evening, some after lunch, some before lunch, some after they ask many people for advice, some they only think themselves, some based on emotion, some based on logic. And each person in the audience has their own preferred method of making choices. And now science becomes good in figuring out what your skills are and helping you f find out what you can be good at. So we can actually recruit people that are going to do better in the, in the workplace, and we can help them make better choices based on their own method of, of figuring out. I'm going to list two more, and then I'm going to leave it for the audience because I have ten more and I'm going to have a second round. Another one is sleep becoming a commodity. So now we know more and more about sleep. We spend about a third of our life sleeping, and presumably nothing really happens then. We know that things happen, but we don't really use that. And now that we know that we can actually affect sleep a little bit, we can actually influence sleep, we can actually navigate dreams, and we can even uh, somehow make you learn content during sleep. We can't teach you Chinese while you're asleep, but if you learn Chinese when you were up, we can actually strengthen your understanding of it when you're asleep. So now there's more and more uses for sleep, and we've started to see inventions that I'm working on and my colleagues are working on to actually make more use of these seven hours that you spend with your eyes closed and presumably unconscious. And I know that afterwards we're going to have Deepak Chopra speaking, and I had the privilege of spending a little bit of time uh, debating him a few years ago in a conference about consciousness, so I'm going to argue now, and he's going to argue against in a second, that we're going to, over time, learn more and more about the brain, such that we're going to consume things that are now regarded spiritual and explain them logically by looking at the brain. Less meditation and more understanding what's happening in the brain. Less uh, communicating with past lives and just accessing uh, uh, things in the brain by understanding how the brain works. I think that this is something that's going to be more and more because neuroscientists are beginning to understand this placebo effect better and better and are able to do better just by helping people understand their own brain. Hi, I am an AI person and a uh, cognitive scientist, and I think that building systems is the best way of testing theories about the mind. I think that artificial intelligence is our best bet for understanding the mind. And in recent years, AI has made tremendous progress with deep learning, which models some of the perceptual processes that go on in our brains, um, with probabilistic models and also with cognitive systems, that is, systems that try to emulate the functionality of the mind in terms of affect, motivation, perception, and the interplay of all these. And we have started to gain much deeper understanding now of processes like mental representations and perception and decision making and motivation and emotion and so on. But I don't think that there's a silver bullet. I don't think that full AI, that is a system that is able to think in the same way as a human does, that is creative in just the same way as a human does, is just around the corner. I think, of course, it's eventually possible. And if we can make it in the few years or decades that we as a technological civilization have for decent research, um, it's going to happen, definitely, but it's not around the corner, and I think that the minds around, uh, that we are going to see in the foreseeable future are going to be hybrid minds, minds that do combine human intelligence with artificial intelligence. At the moment, we have systems that if you use them, you have to model their state in your mind. This creates a tremendous cognitive load, and it limits the complexity that those systems can have to serve you efficiently. The systems of the near future will model your mind. They will know what you want. They will model your goals. They will model your affective state. They will model your emotion. They will model what you know and what you do not know. 
We have already started externalizing knowledge when we use Google. We know that knowledge is at our fingertips. We don't need to remember to memorize everything. But what we are going to do in the near future is we will externalize some of our agency. That is, we will become hybrid systems between humans and artificial agents. We will have applications that allow better planning and scheduling between people because if people have more seamless interfaces to their artificial systems, then they will also have more seamless interfaces between each other among, along organizations and so on. Something else which I think we are going to see in the near future are systems that enable us to use our motivation better. We have a lot of games now that make us do very boring, stupid stuff and keep us motivated doing it. And we are just about starting to learn how to harness the research that goes on in this pretty stupid gaming industry for productive things, for things that we actually want to do. So in the near future, I foresee a lot of applications that will enable us to determine what you, uh, your goals are and then create an environment which rewards us for pursuing those goals and make us more effective at what we actually want to do, at self-actualization, at interaction with other people and so on. So this is another wave of applications that we are going to see. And something else which is also dear to my heart, I think that we are going to see big advances in programming. We are going to see new kinds of programming paradigms which make the work that we all do more efficient. That is, we will all also have uh, symbolic programming, something that uh, Stephen Wolfram is right now proposing and starting to propose with this new Wolfram alpha language. And we also have something like disambiguating programming. You know, natural languages are very different from programming languages these days. In natural languages, you do not only construct things by piling knowledge on top of each other, but you also disambiguate a lot. You imagine that everything possible is given, and then you limit the space of the, these possibilities. And I think that we are going to see part of this in programming in the near future. So these are some of the mind enhancements I think we are going to see in the next few years. Well, I'm very excited about your augmented information-driven connections to the brain. And talking about it on our, in advance of our panel, I think we should probably start a company together where we can use your software and our input-output mechanisms from Halo to read and write to the brain and actually implement that hybrid mind. I mean, this is the fantasy of a device that's wired into your brain and calculates pi when you're asked, or that takes straightforward direct stimulation you're already familiar with, uses the algorithms for learning but accelerates them, and leaves you with a language after the program is run. And I think that fantasy actually is coming closer if you can support learning in sleep and if you can introduce patterns that you recognize later in consciousness, I think it's just a series of steps that five years is a, a fine horizon to estimate. There's this uh, quote by, I think, Bill Gates that I keep reading in the talks that, where he says that uh, people uh, uh, overestimate where the world is going to be in 10 years and underestimate where it's going to be in one year. So I'm a... Uh, uh, on this camp, thinking that uh, five years uh, seems to me like uh, we're probably going to have just one more little dent on the same things we know right now. But there is one thing uh, that I feel is advancing pretty uh, fast in neuroscience and pretty slow ethically. And that is this field that I think some people call human 2.0. And the idea where we are far advanced in neuroscience and not advanced uh, ethically is the following. Uh, we now have the ability to read some activity from the brain and know what you intend to do. Meaning, when you're about to move your arm to the uh, left, we know what part of the brain kind of gives the order, and we can really relatively fast know that you're about to do something. We can, in theory, uh, wrap your hand around uh, in the back and connect a robotic arm to your uh, uh, kind of shoulder, and now when you think about moving left, we're going to move this robotic arm left, and we basically teach you very rapidly to control a robotic arm such that you think moving left, it moves left, you think moving right, it moves right, you think moving up, it moves up, and you learn to grasp this bottle of water just by thinking. What's interesting is not that we can do that. What's interesting is that once we untie your own arm, 
you still use the mechanism in your brain to control the robotic arm and are able to both use your arm and this robotic arm. So effectively, you gain the third arm. Now, we know how to do that right now, how to make people gain abilities to have a little more uh, control of, say, a third arm or, or maybe to move their wheelchair with the same part of the brain that moves their hands, which effectively means that we can now enhance function. We can take people and give them more and more things. Now, evolution is pretty, pretty slow. So if I wanted to fly in my lifetime, it would take maybe a couple of millions of years until evolution is going to give me wings. But now we have the ability to actually put some wings on your back and just teach you how to flap your thoughts in a way to make you fly, to get this human 2.0, which is, seems like something that, that is far-fetched in the future, but we actually have the technology to do it. What stops us right now is the uh, religious part of us that says, no, no, this is our body. I do not want to do any change to it. And here's an example of that. My dad uh, had, this little, had this little crooked tooth. And he went to a dentist who said, you know, uh, instead of putting braces, it's going to take like a one year until we uh, align your teeth. I can just remove all your teeth, break them, and put porcelain ones instead. It takes one hour, and you get new lined teeth. And my dad said, are you crazy? These are my teeth. You're going to take my teeth and put porcelain one? And in a way, this embodies our fear. We all know that there's, in theory, a way to replace our body with new things. But we say, no, no, this is ours. I was born with this, this is mine. I can't put those new things. And so whereas science is able to give us many new functions that we know, know, know now how to do, we're still lagging in the ethical well, with idea. With this, I completely uh, agree. If I tell you I have a gadget, I can put it on your head and just turn on the power, and it will make you smarter. There is one camp that will raise their hand immediately, especially in a room like this, and many others will run away screaming. Certainly the most conservative and thoughtful of you will be cautious about it. And I think the story is not new at all. It's as old as Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, and the novel was written to the very first Italians that worked with electricity on the body. Very familiar fear of what must be the trade-offs. Yoshka made the same point. But as much as the power of these ideas first makes its debut with people who have a problem, something broken, a broken tooth that you replace, the most exciting thing is absolutely augmenting and enhancing the elite the highest level performance, our highest faculty is our cognition and what we can do with our minds. There are experiences that very few people in the world have ever had. Transcendent experiences of ecstasy or meditation or enlightenment, things that we think are not real, but we're now we're finding these neuroscientific bases for these. If we can invent and deploy a technology that can make that kind of ecstatic, transcendent experience widely held, it is extraordinarily exciting. Yeah, what would happen if millions, I mean, if you think about what literacy did to the human population, just reading and writing, imagine if we could access these higher order functions in our own, in our own minds, things that we've never seen. Okay, the problem with disruptive technologies, of course, is that they are disruptive. That is, if they go counter our cultural expectations and tradition and inertia, then they are going against uh, trouble. You know, example is Google Glass, which gets a lot of flack from a lot of people which think that's an invasion of privacy or that it turns people into borgs. So even if it's a very efficient technology, it might be that there needs to be a path effect like with the phone. Uh, now it seems to be normal that everybody is borked to their uh, iPhone or Android phone uh, walking through the street and uh, linked to a virtual reality while they are navigating this flash room. Uh, it was possible because with a trajectory effect. And uh, so if you want to have a radically new technology and want it to catch on, so either it needs to be tremendously useful or it needs to work in the existing environment in a rather seamless way. So one line before we finish. If you have to gamble your money on the next five years of, of a neuroscience uh, company, what would you do? What would you put your money on? I think the company Yosha and I found after this meeting <laughs> is the one. <laughs> it's the hybrid 2.0. Okay. Okay, if you want to invest, address me later. <laughs>